So let's go together now as we talk about, in part two, life. Some assembly required. God gives us a life, and he said, I'm going to bless it. I'm going to fill you with purpose. I'm going to fill you with joy. I'm going to fill you with destiny. He gives us his spirit to fill us with power and makes it possible for us to live an overcoming life, the life of an overcomer. However, the assembly lies in what we do with the life we've been given. Does that make sense to you? We've all been given a life. I don't care who you are. You still have the same amount of hours in a week. I don't care how much money you have, what you look like, what nation you're from. If you're alive today, you still have the same amount of hours in a given natural week. And that's been the reality of everyone's life from the time they're born, regardless of the nation, or even the era of time in which they were born, they still had only so many hours in a week. And some people make those hours productive and some people don't. Some people in the process of living make wise decisions and some people don't. Some people make unwise decisions because they've never been taught the principles of how to make a wise decision. So is it their fault? No. But will they still suffer some consequences? Yes. You understand that ignorance of truth is really not an excuse that uh, life is going to listen to. Can you imagine someone be standing before a judge, which they do all the time, and say, I didn't know. Very seldom does that move a judge to rule differently. Because their mentality is, we govern by the rule of law. And there are only so many mitigating circumstances that we're going to take into account. You understand that we live in a day and age where everything People want to become a mitigating circumstance. I was born on the wrong side of the tracks, the right side of the tracks. I don't look right. I didn't have enough money. I didn't, you know, my father wasn't around. My mother wasn't around. All painful, all real. But if every one of those things were to be taken into consideration, no one would be guilty of anything. And that's where the liberals want to be pushing our society, and that's why we're a disaster. So understand that God wants us to be trained and equipped by his word. Uh, in fact, if you have your Bibles, let's turn to one verse and then we're going to dive right in. 2 Timothy chapter 3. Forgive me, we'll read two verses. <clears throat> 2 Timothy chapter 3. Now, you see, Paul was encouraging his son in the faith, Timothy, and he says to him in verse 15, he said, hey, Timothy, you can succeed, you can be brave, you can be bold, you can fulfill God's will, because from the time you were a child, you have known the Holy Scriptures, correct? And what's the result of knowing the Scripture that's in God's heart for us? That are able to make us wise for salvation or unto salvation. That is the first and foremost that through knowing God's word, we can come to faith in Christ. Of course, that is the preeminent decision that the Lord wants his word to bring us to. But then how about after that? After that, we see in verse 16 that all scripture is given by inspiration of God, and it is profitable. It will bring a return. It will bring a reward. Like an investor wants a return for their investment in a corporation. When we invest our lives in God's word, we're going to get a return. And the return will be, we're going to get sound doctrine. By the way, this is why it's important to be in a good church. Hello? That's why it's important to be in a good church. It's important to be faithful in the church. we got too many people trying to bounce around like tumbleweed, trying to live electron in the electronic virtual world of church. Listen, that's only a piece of the purpose of God for the New Testament church Amen. is hearing all the preachers that you can, you know, you click 24 hours a day and hear someone preaching. That's great. But you have no sense of community. You'll have no sense of involvement. You'll have no sense of mi collective mission. You'll have no ability to be accountable. 
if you don't live faithfully to a local church. I mean, take the book of Hebrews 13, verse 17 says, Obey those who have the spiritual authority in your life because they watch out for your souls. Does it mean follow them blindly off a cliff? No. It just means willingly submit yourself to those who have been spiritually placed over your life because they watch out for your souls. Let them do it with gladness. In other words, don't be a knucklehead. Let them do it with gladness so it'll go better for you and it'll go better for, and they can do their job better in, in bringing you along in the things of God. So my question would be, if you want to live in the virtual world, how are you going to obey somebody in the Lord who's over you? You have no one over you. You can obey your computer. <clears throat> so you need somebody to call you out when you start to step to the left or the right. That's the essence of the good shepherd's the crook and the staff. Oh, oh, no, you don't. Okay, now. By inspiration of God, and it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and look at this last one, for training or instruction in righteousness. That means how to live right before God, what does the Lord say about holy living, etc. But I want you to go to verse 17, and you'll see that part of how this plays out is this way. That the man or woman of God may be complete, that means fully mature, Thoroughly equipped for what? For every good work. That means the, one of the culminations of God's word besides working in me, besides being Christ-like, is to fulfill purpose in the earth. I can't fulfill God's purpose if I'm a clueless person. So that's why God wants us to fulfill purpose and he wants us to mine out his word so that we can know how to make successful decisions, wise decisions, so that we can fulfill purpose and not have that thing short-circuited on us. Okay, go to the top of your outlines now. <clears throat> Barnabas and Paul are men that have risked their lives for the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, look what I've written on the introduction for you. Success is largely determined by the choices that we make. But every decision has an element of risk to it. Frank Borum said, we make our decisions and then our decisions make us. Isn't that powerful? It is therefore extremely important that we learn the steps necessary to facilitate wise decision making in our lives so as to avoid potentially adverse and extremely costly consequences. How many of you know if somebody says to you, I got a sure thing at the casino, and you take your life savings, your family savings, and you go down and be an idiot and blow it all, you have no one to blame but yourself. You say, well, I only did it this once. Great. Maybe you never set foot in that place again, but it could take you the next 20 years to bail yourself out of that financial decision. Right? So you did it once, but it could take you the next 20 years because it was an unwise decision that carried long-term consequences and maybe short-term repercussions in that your wife said, I'm leaving you because you have troubled our house. Now, look at what's in the shaded box for you here. And some anonymous writer wrote, whatever choice you make, makes you. So choose wisely. Now, it, when we move along this idea of making wise choices, we understand that I've put in here, every decision has an element of risk to it. If you're looking for the scriptures to tell you exactly when to make a decision and exactly what decision to make in every circumstance you face, you're, you're, try, you're misapplying how God's word will be used for you. How many of you know there are some things that we face in life that there's not a particular scripture for? But if you're wise, you know how to pull a principle out. It will be a principle-based circumstance, but you've got to get the principles on the inside of you. Now, having said all that, when it all plays out to the end, there is no, there going to be no um, substitute for faith being at the root of whatever decision we make. 
There's no such thing as faith without risk. But risk doesn't mean foolishness or presumption. But faith will always involve risk. So I want you to get that into your heart, get that into your head today. There will be no such thing as moving in faith without moving in some dimension of risk. So when we get double-minded about this stuff, double-mindedness will be disastrous. If Debbie and I were double-minded about launching this church, we wouldn't be here together. Because nothing felt good to us about leaving South Carolina and coming back to where I wanted to leave. The land of the frozen chosen. <laughs> New England. I love New England in the rearview mirror. But God had other plans. He said, no, because you're from here, I want to bring you right back. Because you understand the culture. You understand the mentality up here. Sub southerner coming up here is going to get his head handed to him. I don't care what you pull off in Texas or Georgia. Bring it. Bring it. We'll see what you got going on. I was telling someone the other day, we talked to this dude in Texas one time after a conference. He worked in this sporting goods shop. And one thing led to another. I could tell he was a believer, so we started talking. Debbie and I started talking with this guy. <clears throat> and he, he said, you know, what do you all do for a living? We told him. I said, well, where do you go to church? He said, well, I go to this church about two miles from here. Oh, really? What kind of church is it? And whatever. <clears throat> Bible teaching church, and he said, well, you know, we're only 18 months old, so we're still, man, we're still trying to find our sea legs, and, you know, okay. I said, just out of morbid curiosity, <clears throat> how, many, how many people you got going to your church? He said, 18 months, mind you. I said, yeah, 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 yeah. That's a Texas 18 months. Go ahead. He said, 900 I said, yeah. He goes, you're not surprised? I said, down here? No. I said, I promise you, you pull it up where I am, you'll have nine. You just leave those two little zeros off. So bring it. See what you got going up. <clears throat> now, so faith involves decision making. I want you to consider these three guys. Moses got a dream from God, <clears throat> had a word from God to set people free. Noah got a dream from God, had a word from God <clears throat> to build that ark and to save the world. Abraham had a word from God, you know, to go follow the word of the Lord and ultimately go into the promised land to formulate a new people, God's people, covenantal people. But guess what? Moses had to have the guts and make a decision to challenge Pharaoh. Right. He didn't know whether he'd get whacked in there. At some point, he had to bring it. God spoke to him in the desert, but how do you know what you hear in the desert? Now you're standing in Pharaoh's court. <laughs> Oh, man, this guy's got 50 Navy SEAL Egyptian soldiers around him. His throne is about 15 feet high. What was that I heard in the desert? Oh, man. See, all that just disappears. Noah had a word from God to build that ark, but guess what? He had to build it with the whole world mocking him. And he built it for lots of years. Lots of years he had to carry that construction project on when he had never seen it rain like that before, let alone try and build this monstrosity. Abraham had that word from the Lord that God was going to cause him to be the father of many nations. But he had to have the guts to make a decision to leave his natural home and natural family in order to do it. Uh, by the way... <clears throat> Don't ever, please, don't ever use that excuse on me. Well, Abraham didn't know where he was going. I'm going to hit you with a rubber hose if you ever bring that to him. <laughs> the 
shouldn't try and make a doctrine out of one random example. We live in the New Testament. Right. 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 <clears throat> well, I'm leaving, Pastor. Where are you going? I have no idea. <laughs> oh, please. You got a life, man. Think the Spirit of God is clueless? He will always cause you to bear more fruit. That will be the evidence of a good decision. So some of you are struggling with some decisions today, maybe, or some of you will struggle. We will all struggle with some faith decisions. So today we're going to do our best to help mine out some principles that I think will help us, all right? Let's go. Let's go to the eight decision-making keys that we can mine out of Proverbs. I'm going to have to move pretty quickly with this, so bear with me. Step number one, if you're going to make any decision, let's say that you have a dream in your heart to start a business. It doesn't have to be something overtly spiritual like launching a church or a ministry of any type. Let's say God's called you to start a business, to start a sober house, maybe a Christian sober house, whatever it is, a feeding program, I don't care what it is, these principles will apply. Number one, pray for guidance. And that's the principle of inspiration. There'll be little principles I'll put parenthetically at the end of the, of the point. Um, the principle of inspiration. You need inspiration. You need revelation. That's where your journey must begin. Now, you see the scriptures here. Proverbs 28, 26 says, a man is foolish to what? To trust himself, to trust what he thinks he's feeling in his gut, or she, obviously, because it could have been bad chili from last night. <clears throat> but you see, the last scripture, James said, if any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God. Then when the Lord gives it, he's got to believe and not doubt. And look at the last line. He said, sometimes people quarrel and fight. Oh, believers never do that. Of course they do. Sometimes they move in selfish ambition. Sometimes they get bent out of shape if they don't get a particular position. That's what he means here. You quarrel and fight. Because you don't see much going on in your life. And when you see something happen in somebody else's life, you want to take that. Because you feel like that should belong to you. And you justify in your mind why. But James said that's not where it's at. He said, often you don't have because you don't ask. So ask. So we've got to start any journey like this by getting God's perspective. How does he see it? You know, the Bible says in Proverbs 14 that there are, there's a way that seems right unto a man, but the end of that path pathway is the way of death. So something might seem right, but if you trust yourself... <clears throat> You can go off a cliff somewhere. You know why? Because our intuition, our thoughts, are never 100% accurate. Anybody ever trusted your intuition and you were wrong? If not, you will. You're going to feel things from time to time. You're going to make choices. You're going to feel like, wow, I really feel like calling so-and-so. Let's say someone that you had some friction with two years ago, three years. You call them up. Hi. Hi. I'm just calling to say hi. What do you want? The real warm discussion will follow. <clears throat> you see, right then, maybe you had these good, warm feelings. Maybe it's something that you felt like, you know what, I'm going to reach out, but it was not received on the other end. Sometimes that's God. Sometimes you're planting a seed for the future. But in lots of cases, it was just you. Does it mean it's bad? No. But it don't look for good fruit necessarily, you know, like per a parade when it's not received. I remember the night before I got married. <clears throat> but I had a tumultuous night's sleep. Maybe some of you did. You know, <laughs> come on, man. You're moving from single, a single life to what's this going to look like? I'm going to be married. I'm going to be, I'm going to be with one person for the rest of my life. I'm going to be. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, I, I love Debbie. 
But you know, your natural person is going through changes. If you just move right into marriage without giving a second thought, you got issues. That means you're taking it way too lightly. It's not some picnic you're moving into. It's going to take work. It's a blessing. But anything worth a blessing is going to take you a lot of effort. Yeah, I think I'll get married this week. Yeah, you do that. You'll be seeing the judge next week. So you, but I remember going through these. I remember thinking, what if I got in my car and just drove to California? <laughs> Said, no, that wouldn't be good. Come on. I love my wife. <laughs> Next month, we'll be married 37 years. Oh. The point is, if I would have followed those silly feelings, I would have missed the best decision in my life. Amen. Good? Is that good? All right, now. I'm a goalie. That was a massive save right there. All right, no. All right, so here's the key question. When you're trying to sort it out at this level, you're trying to sort out, here's the key question. What is God's will here? Not what do I want to do, but what is God's will here? Because very often the Lord will make his will pretty clear in front of you in some way or another, if you have eyes to see. So here's what I would recommend to you. Number one, ask yourself, what has been, examine what's been in your heart for years. In other words, if you were 11 and then 18 and then 22 and then 25, and it's always been in your heart to start a business, always been in your heart to be a business owner. And now maybe the timing of God has come. So what's already, what's always been in your heart? Because I'll tell you, what's always been in your heart is very often placed there by the Lord. And the Lord now will bring it to seasons where he'll water it, he'll nurture it, and then he brings it like these shoots coming up now out of the earth. Amen. To everything there's a season, so maybe your season's coming. But it will be consistent with what's been sown in your heart by the Holy Spirit. How many of you know that he's the giver of good gifts? And he's the giver of dreams. Now, the second attached question would be this. Have you received any prophetic words in your life? And if so, what has been a consistent theme of those words? If a consistent theme in your life has been eight out of ten words have always mentioned business, but you'd really like to be in ministry, or they've been about ministry, but you'd like to be in business, it doesn't mean you have to make it either or. But you have to weigh that now against a decision that you're making today. Because it doesn't matter what we want to do, it matters what we're called to do. Many times what we want to do in our natural person is because we're enamored with what, it, what looks luxurious and appealing to what's because of what someone else is doing. But how many of you know that when you're watching someone else do it and they make it seem effortless and all this kind of stuff, it's because they're called to that. You try it and it will destroy you. So the Lord will always confirm these things prophetically if you're in a spirit-filled church. That is the purpose of prophets. So nine cases out of ten, it will confirm what's in your heart. Not supposed to give you massive direction in the New Testament. We have the Spirit of God living in us. He's the direction giver. Prophets serve a powerful place, but their place will be 10% direction, 90% confirmation. In other words, if, the, if some prophet walked up to me today and said, Thus saith the Lord, go sell your house and move to China, I'd say, You go move to China. You sell your house and give me the proceeds and I'll invest them in the kingdom of God here. Go to China. To put you on a boat to China. 
Guess what? Because it's not in my heart at all. Doing what I'm doing today is what's in my heart. So I don't care who that prophet is. If it doesn't bear witness with what the Lord has spoken and what's in my heart already, no way. We live in the New Testament, not the Old. Number two. So the first thing you got to do, Lord, I want to know your will, then pray for guidance. Second, moving along this line of thought. Second, get all the facts. And what I call is the principle of information. If you're going to start a business, you better get all the facts about that business. How many other people are in your area that started businesses like that? What's your competition going to be? What precisely in an area, a business area, what precisely, what will be your niche that you're planning to fulfill that a hundred other people in your area aren't already doing? You better get all the facts. How many businesses like this have started in the last five years? How many have tanked? What am I going to bring that's going to be better, different? Do I have enough money? Because if I don't make profit for two or three years, do I have enough money to feed this beast until I, get, until I make profitability? Is it going to take investors? Man, you better get all the facts or you're going to have your head handed to you and your life savings gone. See the scriptures under point two. Every prudent man acts out of a place of what? Inspiration and emotions. No, knowledge. Look at the next scripture. I've used very simple translations purposely. What a shame. How stupid to decide before knowing all the facts. And see in the shaded box, it's never wise to make decisions without knowing the truth. Doesn't matter what your desires are, you've got to know the truth. The truth is, 99% of the businesses like yours that have started in this area have failed. Well, then either you believe that you're going to be the miracle person or you've got to find out why they failed because maybe it's a regional thing. You can't start it here. You have to go to the next, next county over. Get all the facts. Okay, now... So, the key question when you're grappling with number two is this. What are the things that I need to know? That's what you have to be asking when you reach this level. You're praying for guidance. You feel like, ah, oh, man, maybe this is the time to start that business. Boom, stop it right there and go into a massive fact-gathering season. What are the things that I need to know? Number three. Ask for godly counsel. Okay? You've prayed for guidance. You think you're feeling something. So then you start to do your homework. Now you bring it into more of a spiritual context by starting to get wise, godly counsel about that. You see the scripture right under number three? The more wise advice you get, the more likely you are to win. Now, here's the key, guys. It is, it's wise to learn from experience, but it's far wiser to learn from the experiences of others. If five other people like you have already walked into a meat grinder or propeller blade, it's good for you to learn from that experience that they had. You don't have to go through every door face first. Life is too short to learn everything by trial and error. I don't know about you. Maybe you have that time to waste. I have no desire or time to want to learn everything by firsthand experience. That's just dumb. It's much wiser to learn from the experiences of others, obviously, apart from the ultimate truth here. So get all the advice you can. Um, in fact, when somebody wants to start a business, we have several business people in the church here that we have sent people to over the years. We said, look, 
We're going to send you to some people that are, have a strong business orientation. Sit down with them, and they'll bring some larger perspective, real-world perspective to uh, these bubbly feelings that you're feeling in your stomach. You know, the scripture in Proverbs verse, chapter 20 and verse 5, it says, Counsel in the heart of a person is like, a deep, like deep waters, but a man of understanding knows how to draw it out. Amen. See, here's the point. You have to know what questions to ask if you want to get the right answers. Right. Only right questions will bring you right answers. So learn to ask questions. <clears throat> now, I need to put a little asterisk here. Some people get badly misled. We've seen hundreds over the years, hundreds, because they ask the wrong people for advice. Yes. Not that they're bad people. They're well-intentioned. But guys, there's a reason why someone in your life is supposed to be a set stone. Right. You know, the priest in the Old Testament had an ephod which is a really luxurious, kind of elaborate vest. And he had 12 stones, one stone for each of the tribes of Israel. And they were beautiful, adorned. So those set stones were, were specifically set there. And uh, there are people that are set in your life, and there are people that just roll across your life. You better know the difference. And people that have gotten in trouble, it's because, like a Rehoboam, they asked the wrong people for advice. Right. You know what you're getting? An opinion. Amen. They're not a set stone in your life. They're just a friend. Right. They were never ordained to speak into your life like that. Amen. They're ordained to speak into your life laterally as a man speaks with his friend face to face but not this way. More people have gotten in trouble by doing that than anything else I've ever seen. So you see the two scriptures? Get good advice and you'll succeed. I think it's on the back side of your sheets now. And look at this last one. The intelligent man is always open to new ideas. In fact, he looks for them. All right? So if the, listen, I'll tell you what we've done. We've had business people tell the people that we sent them, there's no way in this world that you're ready to start a business. <clears throat> you're quenching the spirit, brother. No, I'm telling you the truth. I mean, you're about as qualified as Connecticut is to balance the budget. It's true. Check out our state debt. Tell me I'm wrong. Number four. Okay, now we're getting counsel. Now we're moving along this pathway of making a wise decision. Number four is this. Set your goals. Set your goals. Begin to set your goals. This is the principle of selection. Set your goals. And you see the first scripture there, or really the scripture under point four, says an intelligent person, circle the next word, aims at wise actions, but a fool starts out in many directions. You don't go to a target shooting competition, a rifle team competition with a shotgun. Hello? You use a rifle with a round in it. A shotgun, boom, filled with, buck, filled with buckshot, is just going to get, you know, one piece of buckshot in every circle and everywhere. But you'll be effective at none. So be intelligent. Be wise about this. Um, you ever meet someone like that? They always, every week they got a new idea. Every week they're going to do something else. Every week they're starting out in another direction. They need to just chill out. I'll tell you what, Debbie and I were never, listen, never confused about what God called us to. 
When we felt the call, it got prophetically confirmed. We started to do our homework. We did our thing, and we have never looked back. We never had to wonder if we were called to something else. Never did. Never. 35 years now. Understand that you cannot chase two rabbits at once. You better decide which one you want to try and take out. In the game of life, if you want to be a success, you better have a clear target. You better know the target that you're going after and let the other ones go. Selection is the name of the game. You don't have time for everything. You don't have resources for everything. You don't have the energy. Make sure you have a clear-cut purpose. Never take a risk simply to prove it to yourself or to someone else that you've done it. You could lose everything in the process of proving a point to someone else. Or maybe, you know, you're trying to prove your father wrong who always said you'll never amount to anything. You don't get back, especially if he's deceased, you don't get back at someone who's deceased. You don't fight those dead words with wrong decisions. You trust God to be your vindication and live wisely. That is the best vindication. Frustration causes many people to take foolish risks and make foolish choices. Frustration. You've got to find the peace of God. You've got to find contentment in the Lord. You've got to understand that where you are today is okay. Just keep putting one foot in front of the other and let your gift make room for you. Don't reverse that. Let your gift make room for you. Serve your way to the top. Serve your way to the top. Because that's what's pleasing to the Lord because that's Jesus said in Matthew 20. For I, the Son of Man, did not come to be served but to serve. So if you want to be blessed by me, Start to line up with me and look like me. It's really not all that complicated. It's just something that we don't normally want to do. So don't let frustration cause you to make a premature or foolish decision. Have you learned in your life that it's easier to let go of something than it is to find something to go forward with? Because sometimes you're jumping out of the frying pan into the fire. Don't risk things until you know where you're going. Until you've got a clear purpose. It's like the kid who rebels and hates all the rules at home. So the person rebels, moves out. And usually they make 15 bad relational decisions along the way. Because they're rebelling against authority or rules or standards and a lot of times they go out and they do foolish things for a long time and some never get their head together and thankfully some do you know we ever watch a trapeze artist life is like a trapeze that guy only lets go of his bar when he's ready to lock hands when he's ready to transfer to the to the one that the previous guy has already laid going in his direction he doesn't swing one way and say, you know what, I don't like where I am. I'm just letting go. He knows what to reach for, and only in that timing does he let go of one thing and reach for another. You guys okay? So here's the key question. What is my target here? You know, the word goals is from an old English word coming from a root word that we translate jail. Vision is a broad brushstroke, long-term perspective. When you come to the narrow end of the funnel, goals are where it's at. Goals are short-term and medium-term mile marker things that allow you to know if you're making progress or not. So set some goals and see what happens. Number five, count the cost. 
This is the principle of evaluation. I gotta move a little more quickly, guys. Count the cost. Now it really gets into the nitty gritty. You still have to start to count the cost. Now you're starting to calculate risk over against faith. So you need to ask yourself three key questions. Ready? Everybody there? First, is this risk necessary? Is this risk necessary? In other words, is there any other way that I can reach my goal without having to make this particular decision? Is this particular risk necessary? How many of you know that the first way that you think you're going to go about something, if you get some wise counsel, if you wait on God, sometimes he gives you an idea that saves you a lot of time, effort, and money. You're learning to work smarter, not harder. Our goal is not to reinvent the wheel here. Second, the second thing you need to consider at this stage is what will it cost? What will it cost? Everything that's worthwhile in life is going to cost something. Cost money, time, energy. It can cost our reputation. It costs us relationships. So we've got to now count the cost. It can cost us family, cost us friendships. And so we've got to count the cost wisely. How many of you know that Jesus said that? That's why I've put in your shaded box. Jesus gave two parables that speak to this very thing. Before somebody starts to build a tower, they got to sit down and count the cost. Is this worth it to me? You know, when, when the Lord opened this building up, all the money we had in the church bank account went for getting um, environmental work done on the property and uh, testing, the down payment, uh, the lawyer's fees, the closing costs. All the money we had went to just getting a set of keys in our hand. Then we had this monstrosity here that was this whole building looked like a bombed out airplane hangar. Broken floors, what you're sitting on now, believe me, didn't look like this. But in order for us just to get to that point, two things had to happen. Number one, we had to have that money saved so at least we can get in the game. Thank God he gave us wisdom. However, second thing was this. Debbie and I had to put our house up as collateral. So if this church failed, our house was gone. And we had two little kids at that point. We had to push all in. But we weren't doing it just because we didn't care. We want a building. No, it was in conjunction with prophetic words. We had waited seven years, got confirmations. We knew in our heart. We used to come at night and lay hands on this building and pray for it. Even though it belonged to two different businesses, we didn't care. We knew this was the building for us. Seven years later, bang, we get this phone call. You won't believe this. These guys are selling the building. Be right up. <laughs> the next day we were signing papers. We had to stay positioned for purpose. We had to stay in faith, but... Listen, in counting the cost, we knew that once we got this building, it was going to take a quarter of a million dollars to renovate this thing. Where were we going to get it? We have no idea. That's God's business. What our business was, did we have enough money wisely saved up to legally get in the game? The answer was yes. God worked out all the details, but we had to do 18 months worth of work here with guys in the church while at the same time raising a quarter of a million dollars to do it. You understand that that's a miracle. But that miracle didn't happen because we went off in nine directions or we were just hell-bent on having a building to legitimize the church. It was the will of God, and we knew over a seven-year span what he was doing. God moves like a glacier more than he does a lightning bolt. But when he wants to move like a lightning bolt, you better be out of the way or in the way. So you understand, you got to calculate the risk here. Did we give the last thing? Yeah, is this worth uh, Because of this. It's always easier to get into something than it is to get out. How many of you know it's always easier to get into debt than it is to get out? 
plastic. Woo. And that was easy. That was painless. Woo. Didn't even hurt my wrist. I didn't even get carpal tunnel out of that. Some people, the way they use plastic, they will get carpal tunnel. It's always easier to get into a relationship than it is to get out. Hello? It's always easier to fill your schedule than it is to do the work involved in the filling. It's always easier to say yes to something than it is to fulfill those obligations that you said yes to. Now, you can't live without taking risks because if you're not risking something, you're not breathing. You're not alive. But there are ways to minimize the risk. And I would just say this last thing on this point. Never make a major decision when you're depressed, discouraged, or burnt out. Never make a major discouraged a de de decision when you're depressed, discouraged, or burnt out. You will always, always make the wrong one. And don't ever get this in your mind that just because something is God's will that it's not going to cost you everything to get it. That's a pipe dream. Number six, ready? You're going to love this one. Plan for problems. It's the principle of preparation. You see the scripture? says, don't go charging into battle without a plan. Now look at the second scripture. A sensible man watches for problems ahead and prepares to meet them. The simpleton never looks and suffers the consequences. So you've got a plan for problems. Anything that's God's will doesn't mean it's going to go smoothly. God's will will be the greatest thing you could ever do, but the costliest. It's going to cost you everything to get that. Well, I just want to be in the center of God's will. Well, that's great. So do I. But be prepared to give up everything to get that. Right. Your nine to five life, your picket fence, doing things the way you want to do them, when you want to do them, with nobody to tell you when and how to do them. If you can't answer those things in the inferno, you're not ready for the will of God. Right. You're ready for a portion. Right. A portion. Right. I'm telling you the truth. <clears throat> so here's the key question. <laughs> Ready? What can go wrong, and how can I best prepare for that now? It's not if. All kinds of things are going to go wrong. And how, the key is, how can you best prepare for those before they happen? But plan for problems so that you don't get your head handed to you. We are dead center in the center of God's will. And every week we have problems. Every week we have problems that we have to solve. Sometimes they come daily. Wow. Let's go to number seven. You remember, let me just say this last thing. Remember when Jesus said, I'm telling you this stuff now so that when I get taken away by bad, evil men, so when this happens, you'll know I've told you. Right. Don't let your heart be troubled. Neither let it be afraid. You know, all those things. Jesus said, I'm telling you this now, guys, so that when it happens, you won't freak out. Right. This must, these things must happen. That's what we're talking about. If you plan for problems that when they happen, should they happen, you'll already have a plan in place to help defuse that. If not, you'll say, I'm in the center of God's will. <laughs> and you move ahead. And you get hit with two by fours like a gauntlet all the way through. God, that's not fair. Hey, I never told you to be easy. I just told you to be worth it. You're the one who assumed. You know what happens when you assume? Let's go to number seven. Ready? Seven is face your greatest fears. This is the principle of confrontation. If you're ever going to get into God's will and do it all the way, you're going to have to confront your greatest fears. God is not going to use you in something that you're naturally gifted in. 
Most of the time, he's going to use you in things where you're scared to death to do it. So you know that the only good thing that's going to come out of that is going to be by him. We hate to admit when we're afraid. We think sign, uh, fear is a sign of weakness or maybe even faithlessness. But really, fear is a sign that we're real. Fear is a sign that we're in touch with the reality of our emotions. Right. Moses was scared to death. All of these guys were scared to death. Fear, like any other emotion, is God-given and it has a purpose. One of the purposes is that fear is a warning light. Do you ever walk in the dark and walk into some place or approach some place and this feeling came over you like, mm, I'm fearful. I, I don't feel like I should go through that door or, and you go somewhere else, you find out something the next day. Woo, if I only, man, if I would have. You see, fear is like a warning light sometimes. The only person who's never afraid is a fool because he's lost touch with reality. He's a legend in his own mind. Now, see the two scriptures? Fear of man is a bad kind of fear. The fear of man is a dangerous trap. But to trust in God means safety and last. Reverence for the Lord gives confidence and security. So we've got to learn how to cope with these fears. And once you do something, be ready for people to criticize you. Small-minded people in the absence of having an own life of their own, will criticize you for having one. That's right. That's right, yeah. Don't listen to them. Yeah. So part of that is facing the fear of criticism. Right. The only person not being criticized is the person doing nothing. Right. The minute you move forward, you're challenging somebody else's complacency. Wow. Let's go. Now we'll finish up. Here's step eight. Ready? And what is it? Decide to begin somewhere. It's the principle of initiation. You've got to initiate things because even though it's God's will, Debbie and I still had to move. We still had to push our house all in. We still had to... You know, every single day of the building project here, I had to show up with a tool belt and a hammer, and we just had to do this, though. Just had to do it. Well, it's not really spiritual. To you, it's not. Look at what's come out of. Yeah. That's stupid. You understand that whatever you have your eyes on will determine whether you make it or not. Like Peter walking on the water. But if you want to walk on the water, at some point you got to get out of the boat. And you see the last two quotes. Mark Twain said, courage is not the absence of fear. Courage is moving ahead in spite of your fear. Amen. And Captain Eddie Rickenbacker, who was a fighter pilot in World War I, said, courage is when you do what you're afraid to do. Thank you so much for joining us today. If God has impacted your life through this message, please join Victory in reaching people all around the world by sowing back into the kingdom today. You can give at rvictory.org slash give or download the Victory Church app and select give. Find Victory on social media for bonus teachings and content all throughout the week. 